On January 12, 1960, George Jackson was sentenced to one year to life for a $70 gas station robbery. He would serve 11 years, seven months, with seven of those years in solitary confinement. On August 21, 1971, he was assassinated. In the intervening years, Jackson penned two centerpieces of revolutionary canonical texts, Soledad Brother and Blood in My Eye. Jackson's ideas spoken, performed, and reflected by artists, activists, comrades, loved ones. The people to whom he spoke, who now speak him back to us. Welcome to this special edition of I Mix What I Like, George Jackson Releasing the Dragon, a video mixtape. is transformation of our mind. Powerful mechanism transform our emotion is conviction. Not just a single point of mind. In order to increase the ability of reasoning, study is very, very important. I was incarcerated under a wonder life, a term that called for a wonder life, where I could have done one year and been released. I've done 10. That's more time than anybody in the state has ever done on a wonder life. When the prison gates fly open, the dragon will emerge. August 21st, 1971. The dragon has come. I said the dragon has come. Mr. George Jackson. In 1960, when he was 18, he was falsely accused of stealing 70 dollars from a gas station. Though there was evidence of his innocence, he was convinced to plead guilty so he can receive a life sentence. Instead, he was given a one to life, but he served 10 years, and that ain't right. Seven and a half was spent in solitary confinement Label him as a threat because of his movement Soon he met Marx, Lennon, and Mao Black Gorilla family, redeem me How? Studying economics and military ideas No longer will he fear a revolution was near In 1970, you wouldn't believe Three black inmates killed the OG Miller, due to the color of their skin Even though they rumbling, it was murder in the end Three days later, court ruled in favor, justified homicide. Took away their life, someone had to pay the price. Prison guard John Mills killed for payback. George Jackson, one of the suspects, Angela Davis came to his defense. August 7, 1970, his brother Jonathan wanted to see him free. Walked in the courtroom and took hostages. Attempted to free three other convicts. All had weapons and gave this message We are revolutionaries The soul of dead brothers must be free He was only 17 but now he was a man Hopped in a getaway van Drove toward the San Quentin sergeant Police didn't care for the civilians Shot in a van killing him and his gunmen George Jackson was moved to San Quentin While in prison he became an instant celebrity Due to the release of Solar Dad Brother, but he still had to suffer. Reality, he will never be released. Kill me if you can, not kill me if you please. If I leave alive, I'm leaving nothing behind. They will never count him among the broken men. August 21st, 1971, George Jackson, the dragon has come, but how come? He was assassinated, vindicating comrades for injustice. He was a blade in the throat of fascism. Trying to free inmates from a control mechanism called racism. True revolutionary, black militant, Mr. George Jackson. George Jackson, revolutionary. George Jackson, revolutionary. George Jackson, the revolutionary. George Jackson, 
Thomas Jackson, the revolutionary. George Jackson, the revolutionary. Like I remember reading um, George Jackson saw that brother and obviously you know learning about him getting killed in 1971, learning about his brother Jonathan Jackson trying to free him the year before, learning about Angela Davis helping to uh, supply the guns to Jonathan Jackson, then her being the a victim of uh, the FBI witch hunt around the country, and clearly things like Attica happening after George Jackson was killed, you know, I mean, so it represents a lot of stuff to me. So that's why these kind of events again are important because if, it's almost like if they left Malcolm out of history books, you know they're going to leave George Jackson out of history books because he was to the left of Malcolm. The term sound of that brothers, uh, get this clear, the term sound of that doesn't apply to us three only, you understand? It applies to all those brothers down in South Atlanta who've been making moves and who, who are working on the, uh, on the idea that uh, concentration camps won't work on black folks and oppressed people here in the United States. We're just not going for it. Uh, we're together. We're all together, all our cases are together. And uh, when you say sound of that brother, you have pictures on the wall of not just the three uh, uh, original side of that brothers, but uh, uh, all others who fall in the line. You understand? And uh, it should be worked from, from there. Solid brother means all those there in Solidarity who participate. And we're trying to break down that thing there. Pursue our present goal, you know, the proof of, uh, the proof that it won't work on us. In the future, when I get out, we go to a new level. That means liberation of political prisoners. Long live the gorilla. In terms of being a revolutionary, uh, if you wanted, if you considered yourself a revolutionary, then you would want to be like George in terms of his intellect, in terms of his uh, uh, physical stature. Uh, you know, because he, I mean, he was a complete soldier. In my eyes, he was a complete soldier. He knew how to defend himself. He knew how to articulate his ideals. He knew how to organize. You know. And, and he wasn't a very, he wasn't vocal. George was a very quiet brother, you know. I mean, he wasn't, you know, somebody you, you see on a, a a podium just espousing this and that. He wasn't like that. He he quietly passed on his ideals and and direction for people to go. You know, uh, he had a reading list. You know, uh, I mean, I I didn't know nothing about Kant, Socrates, Plato, Spinoza, Nietzsche. Uh, you know, it was through George that, that that I heard about those people and started reading those people because this was all part of a process of becoming a complete, as, as we refer to, soldier. You know, you develop your the way to, to defend yourself. You develop a way to articulate yourself. You develop a way to think, you develop a way to organize and inspire other people, you know, to action, you know. And the whole thing was, you know, look, when, when a lot of us, when we come into this prison system, we came in as predators. We were preying on our community, you know. Now, you know, we're going to make a transformation so that when we go back to those communities, we can be an asset to those communities, you know. We can build those communities, you know, and and that's where you know, like uh, his his reference to Ho Chi Minh and and, and the, the dragon is coming. And that's that's where that comes from because uh, Ho Chi Minh, you know, was a teacher, and also he had been in prison. But he also said that you know, he, in uh, one of his poems was, you know, people who come out of prison can build up the society. You know, when the prison gates fly open, the real dragons will fly out. Well, that's, that's what George was, was talking about. You know, we know, the real dragons will be us uh, who, who have molded ourselves and, and transformed ourselves into be positive and, and, and 
having love for humanity, going back out there and demonstrating that love by building up our communities and, and be, like I said, being an asset to to that community. And then when when they started, you know, like I said, when all the the, the conflict between blacks and guards, particularly white guards, started, you know. Everybody knew when it, when that yard scene went down. Everybody in prison, and no matter what your race was, knew that the police had something to do with it. They shot those brothers down, and a lot of them they just left on that yard to bleed to death. You know they could probably have been saved, except for W. L. They shot. You know they blew his chest out. So a lot of people knew that, that was wrong. But you know what? The courts ruled. That, that what happened in South there was justifiable homicide. You know, and I'm not saying George and Fleet and John had anything to do with, with the killing of that guard. But the point is, when what do you do when the law doesn't protect you from your rights being violated? And that's the way a lot of people felt. And, you know, George, George felt that way, too. Everybody felt that, you know, whatever happened was the only course of action that could have been taken to demonstrate that we're not going to allow you to just kill us, you know, without some kind of repercussions, you know. And like I said, that... It, it, one of the things, you know, George talks about in, in his book, Blood in My Eye, you know, he talks about Frankenstein's monster. Well, you know, we, you know, the system is Dr. Frankenstein, and we are the monsters that it created. <clears throat> but that's no different than, than, than the system uh, uh, in general. I mean, the, America has created a lot of Frankensteins. You know, they go by different names, Noriega and Panama, Osama bin Laden, you know, uh, now we got uh, ISIS. And, uh, I mean, they've created a lot of monsters, you know, and, and we, the same thing applied to us, you know, on, on a, uh, you know, on a, a micro level, they, they created monsters. And the result of, 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 of their creations and all the violence and conflict, that, you know, that erupted and took place in the prison. Black men born in the U.S. and fortunate enough to live past the age of 18 are conditioned to accept the inevitability of prison. For most of us, it simply looms as the next phase in the sequence of humiliation. Being born a slave in a captive society and never experiencing any objective basis for expectation and had the effect of preparing me for progressively traumatic misfortunes that led so many black men to the prison gate. I was prepared for prison. It required only minor psychic adjustments. I begin with the idea that fascism has already taken over this country. It took over uh, uh, during the Depression. And uh, all above-ground political organizations has, has got to proceed. I mean, anything that's effective, that's really revolutionary, I'm convinced. I'm convinced if it's really revolutionary because of the existence of the fascist state, there's going to be there's going to be resistance to every move that we make. Consequently, it's going to take a lot of brain work, footwork, to avoid the pitfalls and traps that the, that the fascists are going to set up for us. I'm convinced that fascism exists in this country. And uh, if you think about it a while, you understand that uh, yeah, one of the principal uh, cornerstones of fascism is disguise. This prison didn't come to exist where it does just by happenstance. Those who inhabit it and feed off its existence are historical products 
The great majority of so dead pigs are southern migrants who do not want to work in the fields and farms of the area and who couldn't sell cars or insurance and who couldn't tolerate the discipline of the army. And of course, prison attracts sadists. After one can see that racism is stamped unalterably into the present nature of America's social, political, and economic life in general. The definition of fascism is a police state where the political ascendancy is tied into and protect the interests of the upper class. Characterized by militarism, racism, and imperialism, and concedes further that criminals and crime arise from material, economic, and social political causes. We can then burn all of the criminology and penology libraries and direct our attention where it will do some good. I know now that the most damaging thing a people in a colonial situation can do is to allow their children to attend any educational facility organized by the dominant enemy culture. Sé que lo más dañino que un pueblo puede hacer en una situación colonial es dejar que sus hijos y hijas atiendan un sistema educacional organizado por la cultura enemiga dominante. The two questions are wrapped up: the, the question of discipline, the need for discipline in order to uh, move forward with the real purpose, and then. Uh, the question of how did and why did the, the, the mayor end up in that position of uh, trust, the position of power, or the, the, the position where where he was, uh, where he where he is uh, uh, giving orders. It's a, it's just a complicated, heavy thing. But uh, I think that we're going to have to learn to uh, reconcile ourselves with the fact that uh, uh, from the smallest units. From the smallest cells on up, we're going to have to relate man, woman, as equals. And it won't be easy. It's got to, it's got to work itself out. Mm -hmm. But the only way it can really work itself out, I'm convinced. And uh, I sure hope nobody mistakes this as uh, male chauvinism of any type. But I think the only way it's probably going to be resolved is that women become more aggressive. And I'm not talking about aggressive in the sense of uh, being counterproductive man, and disrupting. I'm talking about uh, yeah, coming up with uh, a valid, valid criticism and valid ideas and valid contributions. This is a short poem and I just want to do a tiny preface and to say that back around, uh, what, 71, 70, to know about George Jackson as a woman he was the ultimate man for any serious black woman. Okay? I wore a great big fro, and people would say, you look just like Angela Davis. Brothers would say that, and I was like, yeah, now all I need you to do is be a George Jackson. Okay? The poem is called George. This poem does not commemorate ghosts. Ghosts being a white man's conception of a universal entity, this poem will key the unlocked spirit of George Jackson, Jonathan being a whole other testament. This poem is a demonstration designed to re-expose the primitiveness of white people who still don't know that it's time to come up out of that Cro-Magnon-ish. They laid for him, forced him to play the victim for the last time, and even after they filled his body with lead and were sure that he was dead, 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 they handcuffed him, afraid even of his spirit that it might fly up out of his body and avenge it. They tried to capture his soul in death since they were never able to do it in life. And they left his body baking away in the sun for six hours to be sure he was no longer a threat. But little did they know that his people had feasted on his dreams and drank deep the blood in his eye to later go out into the night looking for something white to mutually sacrifice.
principal point behind the uh, prison movement is uh, to prove to the staff that the uh, concentration camp technique, the reversion to uh, the second dimension of uh, fascism, uh, the terrorist face. Let's prove that uh, the state won't work on us, it won't stop on me. That uh, nothing, actually, short of death, is going to stop on me. The courts are, I mean, I they're in a position where they, they, they're not pressured into, uh, into uh, giving us some sort of appeasement. And uh, that, of course, catches the prison personnel, uh, staff, uh, the patriot up in the uh, crown. Uh, they have no way at all whatsoever not to protect themselves except through sheer, boom, open. Yeah. They also know that uh, yeah, the comrades don't fear the courts any longer. My dear only surviving son, I went to Mount Vernon August 17, 1971 to visit the gravesite of my heart. Your keepers murdered in cold disregard for life. His grave was supposed to be behind your grandfathers and grandmothers, but I couldn't find it. There was no marker, just Mood grass. The story of our past, I sent the keeper a blank check for a headstone and two extra sights. Blood in my eye. Georgia Jackson, mother of George Jackson. They, they couldn't let him live. It wouldn't be any way possible for them to let him live. He's a black man. They're afraid that people will begin to listen. And they had. People all over the world had begun to listen to George. And I certainly know the people in this country had. That's the reason why they framed him to be murdered the way he was. To try to discredit everything that he had said. To try to paint him as an insane maniac, an animal. Instrument of change. Instrument of change. Instrument of change. Religious to my family, my mother, my father, sisters, my brother, John. They were intended to familiarize them with the situation I was faced with here. Of course, here in prison, we see the repression, the exploitation, the, the victimization of uh, lower class people. The logical place to begin any investigation into the problems of California prisons is with our pigs are beautiful, Governor Reagan. Radical reformer turned reactionary. For a real understanding of the failure of prison policies, it is senseless to continue to study the criminal. All of those who can afford to be honest know that the real victim, that poor, uneducated, disorganized man who finds himself a convicted criminal is simply the end result of a long chain of corruption and mismanagement that starts with people like Reagan and his political appointees in Sacramento. I'm glad Reagan did. I'm glad Reagan did. I'm glad Reagan did. After one investigates Reagan's character, what makes a turncoat, the next logical step in the inquiry would be a look into the biggest political prize of the state, the directorship of the Department of Correction. All other lines of inquiry would be like walking backward. Like walking you'll backward. Never, never, you'll never, see where you're never going. see where you're going. The first week that I started teaching, I was pretty much just thrown in the classroom. I wasn't given any training, anything. So the first day after introducing, this classroom was set up in a circle. We were supposed to be doing these like restorative circles to get to know each other. So after we introduced ourselves, 
I sat down and I took roll and I was like, I don't know what to do. So it was a, um, a, a full-time substitute in there, just, you know, helping like the new teacher. So he was like, talk about Ferguson, because Ferguson was on fire. So I was like, okay, perfect. So then the next day, I was like, what can I do? So then I was like, it's Black August. So I went online and it, um, the grassroots, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, had a wonderful like PowerPoint presentation on Black August and it had all these events, the Ned Turner Rebellion, the Watts Rebellion, the Haitian Revolution. All of those rebellions were in it and that was like the first lesson that I gave to the students, mainly because I, um, that's just what was happening at the time. And so um, they were really moved by George and Jonathan Jackson. So then I decided to bring in his book and we started reading some of the letters. So when his birthday came, um, I can't remember the exact date, but this young student who really took a liking to George Jackson, a young man, they wanted to read a quote, read a letter in front of the class of George Jackson. So he did that and I saw how it empowered him. And, and as time moved on, when his birthday approached, I gave him a copy of Soledad Brother and he would come back and discuss the letters and. And then he would even come and tell me some things that I didn't necessarily know about George Jackson. So I just saw his behavior changing as he read George Jackson more, as well as Malcolm X autobiography. I was locked up in 1970 as a member of the Black Panther Party and I went into the Merlin Penitentiary and while in the Merlin Penitentiary I started organizing among the prisoners and one of the main things that all the prisoners wanted to do was to read Soledad Brothers. They wanted to talk about George Jackson. George Jackson played a, such an, uh, a role in organizing in the prison system in Merlin and in upper prisons and uh, his book was read and sought after and we couldn't keep enough of the books in the prison and uh, one day actually we were curious as to why are so many people reading the books and what we found was that they were not only reading the books because of the letters uh, they were writing letters out of the book to their loved ones but they were also actually getting educated so the one of the most effective things George did with that uh, Soledad Brothers was that he wrote letters and he wrote political information in bits and pieces that the average person on the ground could learn from. During the organizing in the 70s, we had two examples. One was George Jackson uh, out in uh, California and uh, the Black Gorilla family, the, the organizing for self-defense uh, and that kind of mobilization. And up in New York, we had Attica, uh, which was just a huge, massive kind of uh, insurrection uh, and a takeover of the prison, the whole entire prison for several days. And what we did in Maryland was we looked at both of those situations and decided to, to organize in Maryland somewhere in the middle. You know, to organize for self-defense on the one hand, but also organize to figure out how we can gain control of the population and direct the efforts of the population to change in the prison system. Um, and that led us to organize uh, United Labor uh, Prisoners Unions. Uh, it uh, led us to organize all kinds of activities inside and outside of the prison. And of course, it eventually led to us all being put in solitary confinement and on lockup. And it was while I was on lockup uh, with about four or five hundred other people that we got the news that George Jackson had been assassinated. And the silence and the pain that went through the whole entire housing area that housed about four or five hundred of us. Normally it would be a roar of noise going on. There's people yelling back and forth. There's always uh, uh, uproar going on. People talking, people singing, all kinds of activities. 
That day, there was nothing but silence among all the prisoners, and you, you I could actually hear a pin drop. Uh, that's the kind of effect his assassination had on all of us. Everybody honored and respected George Jackson. Later on, years later, as I continued to organize, one of the things that I found was that George Jackson's blood in my eye, it was one of the most sought after books among young prisoners, even today. Uh, and, it, and it continues to educate long after George Jackson was gone, it continues to educate young people and young generations. And it continues to be a book that prison guards and prison officials fear. And in fact, when they see a note that somebody's reading of Blood in My Eye or Solidarity Brothers, they tend to harass them. They tend to try to either put them in the files as a troublemaker or try to document them so they can send them to Ultramax and other places just because of George Jackson's book and materials like that. George said it, but Huey is probably the, the best person that says it is well more than the sum of our physical parts. Uh, we have the spirit of the people and we have a consciousness that allow us to survive the ordeal of being in prison and grow and organize and educate. And I think when we I think when we engage in organizing and educating and teaching, we continue to grow and we also continue to, to receive energy and uh, support from the masses that uh, continues to allow us to resist the kind of things that uh, the prison is designed to do in terms of breaking the human spirit. We had a song on our first album called Rifles. Yes. And it was dedicated to George and Jonathan. So, if I may, real briefly, it says, uh, well, my part says, Black August, callous hands, man child dying. Price paid, bullets for slaves, God's cannon. For non action, parties been split to two factions. Cross dissolver, black revolver. Tell the judge this will soon be over. Empty the holster, Chairman Mao sculpture. Drowning from that blood in my eye. Come Jehovah, ten years on a one to life, one smoke, a hundred stripes. The barrel kissed the officer's windpipe, rifles. Even the guy that owns the shoe factory, I'm talking about the blacks. Um, they aren't capitalists, of course, because uh, where did they buy their, their leather from, their rubber, their string? Where did they uh, get the building from? Where did they the machinery? You see? The opposition, my opposition at prison is that guy that's making tools, the machine tools. Uh, the huge, um, the huge, uh, a uh, few families that own around the country. The men that uh, sent out expeditionary forces all across the world ripped off about 80% of the non-renewable resources. In the world. Look, that's the enemy right now. Not the, not the little, little, little black cat in the corner who's trying to uh, survive, really. I don't recognize uniqueness, not as it's applied to individualism, because it is too tightly tied into decadent capitalist culture. Rather, I've always strained to see the indivisible thing cutting across the artificial barricades which have been erected to an older section of our brains, back to the mind of the primitive commune that exists in all blacks. 
But then how can I explain a runaway slave in terms that don't apply uniqueness? I had growing up, I had a lot of young boyfriends in and out of um, Oak Hill, like the, the juvenile detention center. And then when they get a certain age, they down DC jail, and then they get shipped off down North Carolina, all over. So I know the reality that it is for black males. And I saw some of the young male students, and I said, well, I better introduce them to George Jackson and Malcolm X, so they know, you know, that you can transform. And even before they, you know, my hope is that they don't go to prison, but I know that's the reality that it, it may happen. I told them one in three black males go to jail. So with that being said, I hope it doesn't happen, but if it does, that at least I know that he'll be equipped with the materials of George Jackson and he can enlighten like-minded individuals in that predicament because I was like, wow, I wish I would have known about George Jackson when I used to write letters to my little boyfriends when they was in jail, but I didn't know at the time. But I think if every young brother in the prison system reads George Jackson's book, it, it can bring so much change within their life. Because I just seen within like two months, one of my students, his whole character changed. And even his relationship with his mother and some of the letters, the, the student was relating to that, George Jackson's relationship with his mom. So um, I'm just amazed. I was just honored when I got the phone call that this project was happening. And so I'm just blessed to be here and I give thanks to George and Jonathan Jackson and all of the brothers, the Solidarity brothers, that work to um, liberate the minds of millions and millions of, of black people. George says to us, arise and walk. Silver and gold have I none. But in the name of that I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I say, rise up and walk. In the name of Denmark Vesey of Charleston, South Carolina, I say, rise up and walk. In the name of the Reverend Nat Turner of Southampton County, Virginia, I say, rise up and walk. In the name of Frederick Douglass, in the name of W.B. Du Bois, I say, rise up and walk. In the name of my brother, Jonathan Jackson, in the name of James McLean, in the name of William Christmas, in the name of Angela Davis, and in the name of George Jackson, I say, rise up and walk. I'm convinced that uh, from here, where we stand right now, the only way to advance revolutionary consciousness is to reestablish the feeling of uh, community, to reestablish our uh, our class consciousness, is to uh, create revolutionary culture. This poem is called "Niggas That Scared Revolution," and George was a revolutionary. He let everybody know that he was a revolutionary. It just wasn't some locked up, you know, ex gang member who was just writing about revolution. George actually believed that he was a revolutionary and he thought that we all had to deal with revolution. And this poem came about, like I had just been in New York about about a month, you know, and we were sitting in uh, Mount Morris Park, that's Abbey O'Doone, the brother of our works were now. And he said, well, Mom, you know, what have you learned since you've been in New York? And I looked around the park, I looked out on Madison Avenue and looked on Lewis Avenue and I said, Niggas are scared of revolution. So he said, write that. So and I did. Niggas are scared of revolution, but niggas shouldn't be scared of revolution because revolution is nothing but change. And all niggas do is change. Niggas coming from work and changing the pimping clothes to the streets and make some cook change. Niggas change the hair from black to red to blonde and hope like the hair that looks will change. Niggas kill other niggas just because one didn't receive the correct change. Niggas change from men to women, from women to men. Niggas change, change, change. You hear niggas say, things are changing, things are changing. Yeah, things are changing. Nigga things into black nigga things. Black nigga things that go through all kinds of changes. The change in the day that makes them rat and wave. Black power, black power. And the change that comes over them at night as they shine and moan. Ooh, white thighs, ooh, white thighs. Niggas always going through bullshit change. But when it comes to a real change, niggas are scared of revolution. 
Well, I have told young young people, like sometimes we have workshops. I have mentioned that George Jackson was on the Miami Express. A lot of people uh, didn't know about it. I'm not talking about the whole situation, the prison situation in California, and the the the, 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 the fact that they were facing, you know. Some terrible situations, Flita, Drongo, John Cluchet, and George, and they were amazed that, that, that they hadn't heard about this, you know. So, but yeah, but see, my thing is to always start telling them, remember, like I was just saying before, there's nothing new here. There are shoulders that y'all are standing on here that you should know about and try to understand and understand that the impact and it, it uh, has been some things that maybe you don't know about but you should know about because this is just this is nothing new we're nothing new the last pause is nothing new there are people who came before you who have made contributions some of them lively and some of them in the moments of death so i try to remember I always remember there's other people who came and did these things before that's why we tell that's the difference between us and hip-hop because we always made sure that people know about John Coltrane, Bird, Monk, and all the beboppers and the swingers do that. And then because these are shoulders people we still love. And like, you know, basically the last pause that we, we just, and, and Gil Scott Heron, I've got to mention Gil, we all just blues singing, singing the blues of our people in different voices and different techniques and different, but it's all the same thing. And go back and try to look in history and try to find these books and read them and try to find George Jackson some of the blood or blood in my eyes and see how powerful and what impact he had on me and all, at that time and other young people around him at that time. Niggas are actors. Woo, niggas are actors. Niggas act like they're in a hurry to catch the first act of the great white hope. Niggas start act like Malcolm did. But when a white man doesn't react to them like he did, Malcolm, niggas act violently. Niggas act so cool and slick. Cause then white people say, what makes those niggas act like that? Niggas act like you ain't never seen nobody act before. But when it comes to acting out for revolutionary causes, niggas like, hey man, I can't dig them actions. Niggas are scared. A revolution. Like I said, back in those days, there was so much going on in California. There were the Soledad Brothers, there was Nathan Hare at San Francisco State, and the students at San Francisco State, and the rides, and you know, and the pamphlets coming into play. And at that time, I was trying to, um, I was really trying to get out there. I told my mother, I gotta get to California, mom. I gotta go, I just wanna go out to California, because I wanna be out there with you and Newton and the pamphlets. And I wanna see, let me go meet George Jackson, and here I am, a little boy, and I don't know how I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do and there's, you know, racism and bigotry and in my town I'm fighting against that but I wanted to be in California because it seemed like, you know, the revolution was going to start and be over in California before I even got into it. I know I, I once told uh, uh, David Hill, Secretary of the Black Panther Party, you know, man, I want to get out of here, man. I want to get out of here with you and you and these guys and throw down and David with the glass of here. That's all we really needed, Omar, you and you out there, both you crazy niggas and open together. <laughs> so, I, you know, boom. But I did. I really wanted to go out and uh, throw down in California because, like I said, it looked like it was just happening. Like, everybody else was talking about it and singing about it and suggesting it, but they were throwing down in California at that time. Niggas are very untogether people. Niggas talk about getting high and riding around in hells. Niggas should get high and ride to hell. Niggas talk about pimping. Pimping what? Pimping yours, pimping mine. Just to be pimping is a hell of a lie. Niggas are very untogether people. Niggas talk about the mind. Talk about my mind stronger than yours. I got that bitch's mind attacked. Niggas don't know a damn thing about the mind or they be right. Niggas are scared of revolution. Niggas fuck. <laughs> Y'all know niggas fuck. Niggas love the word fuck. They think they're so fucking cute. They fuck you around. The first thing they say when they're mad is fuck it. You play a little too much with them. They say fuck you. When it's time to TCB, niggas are somewhere fucking try to be nice to them. They fuck over you. Niggas don't realize while they're doing all this fucking, they're getting fucked around. But when they do realize, it's too late. So all niggas do is just get fucked. Up. Niggas talk about fucking that, fucking this, fucking your sis, not knowing what they fucking for, not fucking for love and appreciation, just fucking to be fucking. Niggas fuck white thighs, black thighs, yellow thighs, niggas fuck ankles when they want other thighs. Niggas fuck Linda, Sally, and Sue, and if you don't watch out, niggas will fuck you. Niggas would fuck fuck if it could be fucked, but when it comes to fucking for the revolutionary causes, niggas reply, man, fuck revolution.
niggas are scared of revolution. I guess it was the artist in me or the writer that was, I was going to become that he was stimulating and that he was invigorating and that he was, you know, inspiring because he, he, he touched me. And when he died, because like I said, I know he was going to die, but I cried about two nights. I, mean, I cried about two days you know, because a hero of mine had just been taken away from me. A hero, a brother who was in the midst of the madness and still fighting and trying to find a way out and trying to show us how to find our way out and this way out outside. So it was, it was uh, very tragic to me how he went out, man. But I know that I know they're gonna get him, and I know they're gonna let him out of prison. I know that. Niggas are players. Ooh, niggas are players. Niggas play football, baseball, and basketball while a white man is covering up their balls. So when niggas play ain't tight enough to play with some black thighs, niggas play with white thighs to see if they still have some play left. And when there ain't no white thighs to play with, niggas play with themselves. Niggas will tell you they're ready to be liberated. But when you say, let's go take our liberation, niggas reply, oh, I was just playing. Niggas are playing with revolution and losing. Niggas are scared. Revolution. Niggas do a lot of shooting. Niggas do a lot of shooting. Niggas throw up the mouth. Niggas cut down the street and shoot down the corners. Niggas shoot sharp glances at white men. Niggas shoot sharp glances at white women. Niggas shoot mm, crap, you know. Niggas shoot guns and rifles on New Year's Eve. A new year that is coming in where white police will do more shooting than them. Where niggas, when the revolution needs some shot. Yeah, you know, niggas are some shooting the shit. Niggas. Scared of revolution. Niggas are lovers. Ooh, niggas are lovers. Niggas love to see Clark Gable make love to Mel Monroe. Niggas love to see Tarzan fuck over the niggas. Niggas love to hear the Lone Ranger yell, Hi ho, Silver. Niggas love commercials. Niggas love commercials. Oh, how niggas love commercials. You can take niggas out of the country, but you can't take the country out of niggas. Niggas are lovers, niggas are lovers, niggas are lovers. Niggas love to hear Malcolm rap. Niggas love to hear Malcolm rap. Niggas love to hear Malcolm rap, but they didn't love Malcolm. Niggas love everything but themselves. Niggas love everything but themselves, but I'm a lover too. Yeah, I'm a lover too. I love niggas, world up. I love niggas because niggas are mean. And I should only love that which is part of me. Love to see niggas go for changes. Love to see niggas talk that shit. Love to see niggas make them play and shoot that shit. But there's one thing about niggas I do not love. Niggas are scared of revolution. Powerful people cannot afford to educate the people who they oppress. Because once you are truly educated, you will not ask for power. You will take it. Slave him in your stomach. Broken Bible verse in your pocket. The watch that watches time like the red line riding towards your heartbeat. The stolen overpriced soul that you can't buy back played back on repeat. Barcodes branded on newborn babies' birth certificates. There's a price set on your life's worth. Selling yourself back to yourself before you can download your self-worth. There is an app that interacts with your melanin, but you gotta die first. There's dirt in my dialogue, blood in my eye, and a callus on my soul. Scratching at the infection like a mad turntable is a bloody crucifix carved into our fingerprints. Cause Lord knows as soon as the cock crows, they will take hold and siphon the guard out of your dick. Fuck you, and fuck them too. I'm Jesus at a peaceful protest, fully strapped. I'm John Brown posting pics on Instagram, a free slave man sold back. I'm Harriet Tubman in the club making it clap. I am Imhotep on crack. I am your worst fucking nightmare, cause I don't know who I am, but I know how to I am. 
A biracial binary baby with an iPhone plugged into his navel Keeping Africa fully charged Only get charged double for the cost of my life back And catch a charge from those in charge Charged with no rights So your damn right is within my rights to write back Nigga Frederick Douglass ain't need Twitter be revolutionary as shit with a like and a click on Facebook But really fake books, read the writing on the walls Marked by Babylon, you've been marked for extinction Call it destiny or death Destiny or lack of access But everywhere you at, you stay online Everywhere you at, so how on earth you lack access The soul of George Jackson The soul of George Jackson The soul of George Jackson I saw Garvey and the boys, iPads plugged in the Baldwin's pigment, down low in Africa's heartbeat, cause the body of God is hardly God's body, when in God's body you're just as corrupt as the devil's be, so do the knowledge be, or rather Deuteronomy. You could be Trayvon Martin, Delaney King, and still not be accustomed to the hood you in. They put Christ in a hood and let the media crucify the spin. But when the zealots was finished yelling, remain equally unaware of the blood spilling and the linen and the lineage of the hood you in. So if you brown, six shots will put you down for the count, cause your very skin is a threat to the world you in. You can't be in the struggle and not struggle. I guess the griot was back with a vengeance. White guilt had sex with white privilege and produced assimilated niggas. There's a railroad of bones at the bottom of the ocean. There's a chamber of souls and the guns our sons are holding. There is a loud graveyard planet beneath every American city. There are a billion black bodies coming back to the living. You thought the zombie apocalypse was some shit? Just wait until you get a hold of my niggas. See, this is the dispensation of truth in the new age. And there's so many slain ancestors coming back for revenge that it'll make reparations look like minimum wage. No justice, no peace, but I will scream justice in this peace if it's just us in this peace. But don't expect no just us once we take to the streets. Black lives don't matter. Black lives are matter. Like space, like stars, like melanin, like matter, nigga. But sometimes I wonder if it all really matters when I hear the devil's laughter and if Dreams are just nightmares that have been shattered. A wise man once told me that the black man was God. If God looked into a mirror and the mirror shattered, and the mirror shattered.
clap your hands, pat your feet, and let's have a little church. What'd you say? Amen. And here you say, yeah. Amen. And here you say, yeah. Can you feel it? Amen. And here you say, yeah. Make, make the deal go through. in my rap, be the first to set it off. You, go, go, you, go against the green, you better hit me. Yo. We bled in Germany and Vietnam and Iraq. Came home to burn in churches and got shot in the back. <laughs> Shit, Bob shot the sheriff for less. He knew exactly who to give to in the chest. If he heard rap now, he'd be fucking depressed. What cash yapping about, I am not impressed. That's another matter for another rhyme. I could deal with coward ass rappers at another time. This rap for rebels, music for killing the devil. In the name of freedom fighters, I rebuke you with metal. It's for all them crackers with the part-time patches. Candidates who Think race ain't important, it's taxes, it's for nine lives Worth more than that rebel rag And all the massacres under American flags It's to honor the fallen, veterans of the struggle The vanguard squad, always ready to rumble You can find us in the streets, we bout that life So the toe with the police, yeah we bout that life Defending mine and yours, yeah we bout that life Since we got to these shores, yeah we bout that life Find us in the streets, yeah we bout that life So the toe with the police, yeah we bout that life Defending mine and yours, yeah we bout that life Since we got to these shores, we bout that life Stand up, jam the man up Complete the plan, then dip and clam up Rise like Bree, man, tough man up Turn some new keys and free the lands up Hands up, like you're black on the block Stop by the cops, open his cameras to watch Hands up like Afro's down with Castro Telling Nixon to lick the asshole Hands up, like you're hungry as fuck Praying nobody tried to press they luck Yeah, black lives matter, man, but so does the rent And what's left from buying medicine, they making a dent They close down schools like your brain in a stroke Then they open up a jail like they cut in your throat They take black life in every way They just use the gun about once a day You can find us in the street we bout that life, so the toe with the police, yeah, we bout that life. Defended mine and yours, yeah, we bout that life. Since we got to these shores, yeah, we bout that life. Find us in the streets, yeah, we bout that life. So the toe with the police, yeah, we bout that life. Defended mine and yours, yeah, we bout that life. Since we got to these shores, we bout that life. Finished the bid with the tool in his wig He was schooling CEOs and had him doing a jig Who's that? George Jackson Black ready for action Ain't a prison yet that could tame the black dragon Ain't too many rebels that's approaching his levels He found the keys to liberation in the belly of devils One of the sharpest dark skinned Marxists One of the system's hardest targets He was a BGFOG Incarcerated arm of the BPP Left coast all of that to San Quentin Nah, command post for organizing resistance I know you heard about his younger brother They take the shoddy round the neck of the judge and burn rubber I wish they made it like Asada did He was a revolutionary with no fear of the power grids Peace the butterfly for the caption My heroes died in prison George Jackson George Jackson George Jackson, George Jackson. Well, I write this what I write in my rap It's documented, I'm in it Every day of the week, I live in it Be the first to set it off Take it off, 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 take it off